So thank you for being here. This is our first ISCE North American webinar. We are planning to continue having these trainings going forward, probably a couple uh, during each semester. They're mostly going to be related to policy and science communication, but we'll probably sprinkle some other things in there as we come across them. Uh, mark your calendars for our next webinar, which will be December 10th at 12 p.m. Eastern. And we're going to be discussing the importance of scientists providing public comment and how best to do that. Um, but here today, we're, we're having this media training 101. We're very excited to have uh, Amy Costin and Emily Copeland here with us. They are from the Science Communication Network, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting environmental health scientists in their efforts to contribute to the public dialogue about their work through the media. So as we know, this can be super challenging. We are super lucky because SCN has been around for 20 years. Uh, they provide media training to folks doing environmental health research. Um, and they also reach out to specific journalists. They have working relationships with a lot of journalists and can help inform them about your science. So I just wanted to mention, if you have papers kind of in the queue that you think might receive media attention, you are welcome to, after this talk, reach out to Amy and Emily. Uh, so we'll send out information again on the Science Communication Network, but you can Google them and they're happy to help you prepare to talk to reporters and try to get your paper a little bit more policy and um, media attention. So with that, I will let them take over and lead us through this, about probably 45 minutes of them chatting, and then um, please go ahead and type questions in the chat, and we'll have about 15 minutes for a Q&A at the end. Great, thank you, Joan. Um, I assume you can hear me all right. I want to welcome everyone to media training. Um, I think that we have folks with a range of experience in media work, so we've tried to find a middle ground here. And um, Emily is going to be running the slides, and she will be jumping in to help with questions at the end. So next slide, please. Em, next slide, please. Yeah, yeah. So today's presentation is going to be in two parts. First, we'll talk briefly about what makes one study news while another one isn't. We'll go through who are reporters and what do they want and need from scientists. And then we'll get tactical, which is actually the fun part. How do you determine your main messages? How do you convey the key points of your research so it's well reported? How to talk about uncertainty that's inherent in good science? How to prepare for those really tough questions you may hear from reporters? And I'll give tips for presentation, for controlling interviews, so they turn out the way you want them to. Um, next slide. So how do reporters decide what to report on? What makes something news? News is, it's a product, it's like toothpaste or soap. It has to sell subscriptions and attract advertisers at, at its most base, basic, that's it. So given that, how do these hardworking journalists decide what is news and what's going to sell? They ask themselves, next slide please. Will this affect the lives of my audience? That's the basic question. Torrential rains out over the ocean, that's news. But when city streets in North Carolina are flooded, that's big news because people are affected. They ask, is it new? Is it something people don't already know, a new study about to publish? And studies that have already published or online already are generally not considered news because they're no longer new, um, which is why when we invite you to ask for our help um, publicizing papers, we need to know before things are published as they're in the pipeline working towards publication. Uh, reporters will ask themselves, is it unusual? So look at this picture, right? It's news because this doesn't happen very often, but if the dog bit the man instead, it would not be news because dogs are known to do that. Is it significant? Some events are new and unusual and they affect people, but they're not that important. Um, a new instrument to measure lead in blood might would probably not be news beyond the medical community, but if it measures a new finding that, say, lead makes kids taller, you know, that would be news. Um, I just want to note that research with relevance to human health most often gets the attention of mainstream media. But we know most research is more focused, appealing to a distinct audience. So something that might get a cover um, story in a medical journal might not even get a mention in the New York Times. But either way, they're both news, and they're both important in bringing the science forward. Uh, next slide, please. 
to reach your audience, you need to know a bit about reporters. You need to know who are news reporters and what do they want from you. And reporters for um, documentary, for talk shows, people doing that kind of research work are a bit different. We're talking about news reporters here because I think that's who you'll work with most often when you're publishing studies. And I say this with a lot of affection because I've been a reporter um, and it's a very hard job. Reporters are generally overworked, they're well-educated, they're highly trained, skilled professionals who are very good at gathering and presenting information. They're not usually experts in your field. They're typically smart, they're under pressure, they might be covering several beats at once. They're on deadline and deadlines aren't flexible. They wanna tell a good story, they care deeply about being interesting to their audience. They need controversy and balance to make a good story, and they'll usually try to show at least two sides of something, even if one side is solid and the other is fringe. Um, that's called false balance. Reporters wrestle with it all the time. Listen for, for it in stories, read it, look for it in articles, and you'll start to see it. Um, reporters try to give the facts with as little bias as possible. They really want to get it right for their editors, for their own sense of professionalism, and they don't take it lightly if someone gives them wrong information or half information. A reporter might be your friend outside of work, but when they're working on a story, you're just another source. Anything you say may end up in the story. That's fair game. As for understanding the science, um, some reporters have PhDs in the fields that they cover, but most don't. The average reporter, you can assume, has had a 10th grade biology class. The average science writer, you can assume some college level science. It's a good idea to find out how much the reporter understands before you assume they're on your level with the content. And some will be, but most won't be. And finally, reporters have word limits and they have editors who edit their work to make a story that will sell. So um, sometimes reporters, um, editors even write the headlines. You may see a story that's exactly as you told it to the reporter, but the headline is way off, which brings us to the next slide, please. This probably rings true for some of you. Next slide. So now you understand a bit about reporters, what they need from you, but I wanna note some basic differences between scientist and journalist cultures. Um, thanks to Nancy Barron for some of this and apologies for generalizations, but you'll get the point. Scientists are specific about what they know. Journalists ask questions and try to convey the main idea using the best information available at the moment. Science is often peer reviewed before it's published. Journalists have deadlines and they can continue to tell stories in future articles, they can correct the record. Scientists talk about what they found and journalists wanna know why that matters to their audience. Science doesn't prove, it disproves. And news media needs to report facts. They report what happened, what is certain, what do we know? But they can later correct the record. Scientists live in a nuanced world with caveats and details while reporters have word limits. And again, they have those editors who need to sell papers. So here are how some of those cultural differences play out. The next slide is a title of a study we worked on. I worked on, I mean, we publicized, we are not the authors. It's got quite a title. And the next slide is what reporters did with it. The next slide is another title. And the next slide is what reporters came up with, how they interpreted it. Okay, next slide. So now that you see how, um, how this works, how reporters are gonna interpret your science, how do you tell reporters about your research so they can report it accurately and understand what's most important when they're not experts in your field? How do you tell them your story? You invert the pyramid. Next slide, please. Um, you may have seen this, you may know it, some of you may not, but to tell their stories, a lot of reporters use this model. In fact, most do. The most important point is in the headline at the top of the pyramid, that's the big message, and details follow um, exactly the opposite of science, science writing. The top of the pyramid are the messages that you wanna see in every article or in every story about your study. And in fact, most reporters will try to tell the whole story in the headline in the first paragraph because most people don't read beyond that unless it's a story about them or something they're really interested in. 
um, you know, even on radio and TV, you get caught in by the first few sentences. It's a story you're interested in or you're not. People decide quickly. And we'll talk more about messaging later, but your main messages are what you want right at the top of the pyramid. So you've decided you're going to talk to reporters. You know a bit about how they think and what they need. An interview is friendly and it can be conversational, but it isn't a chat. You, want to, you need to guide the reporter. You need to tell them what's important and what it means. So you want to go into an interview with a clear idea of what you want the reporter to know and be prepared to say it concisely in several different ways during an interview because people remember things best when they hear them about six times in slightly different ways. Next slide. Um, and this is my pitch for good messaging. You may have heard the phrase shrimp on a treadmill. It's an example of how a great media opportunity can be wasted if you're not prepared with solid messages. Um, an excellent climate researcher had as a byproduct of his research this adorable clip of a shrimp running on a tiny treadmill. His grad student posted it on YouTube and it went viral. And it was so cute that it ended up in front of the Today Show. They invited the researcher on the show, he brought his grad student and the video. They showed up at the studio without prepared messages. They knew their study, they were gonna talk about their work. The Today Show interviewers asked really good questions. Why did you do this? What did you find? However, the answers weren't crisp enough, quick enough, concise enough, and it turned into much more of a chat that left, left viewers with a lot of cute, you know, saying things like, you're gonna try this with lobsters? Do the shrimp ever get lazy? Do they sprain their ankles? Do shrimp have ankles? So it's a great interview for today, but not so great for the scientists. Um, and the scientists lost this wonderful opportunity to tell the world about their important research. They unintentionally squandered that um, because they weren't prepared with clear, concise messages. So to make sure this never happens to you, we're gonna talk about messages. And um, for scientists their mess who are presenting new research, their messages are generally what you found, and why it matters, why people should care. You're talking about your research. You're there to talk about the science. You're not trying to persuade anyone, convince anyone, or spin any facts. So next slide is you need clear messages. If you know what you want to say before you start interviewing, you'll have more control during the interview. One way to organize your thoughts is to think about the two or three most important things you'll be discussing. Um, most likely it's going to be what you found and why people should be interested. You can write those main messages on file cards and keep them in front of you during phone interviews. These, these are the main things that um, you want to see. Remember that inverted pyramid? The points you want to see in the top tier, the headline and the first paragraph. Rather than going with what the reporter is interested in, you can drive the interview by keep going back to your main messages repeatedly. That's how you flag for the reporter, this is what's important. And they'll be looking to you to do that. Message, messages should be in clear everyday language, short sentences, no jargon. Um, practice on friends who aren't involved with your work and make sure they can easily understand what you're saying. You know, your friends are probably very smart and you know, will get it pretty quickly. Audiences are pretty smart too. They generally can get things. Once you have your main messages, you want to repeat them several times throughout the interview because remember that people remember things um, best when they hear them six different times in slightly different language. Repetition is how you flag for the reporter what's most important. So if reporters don't have to guess what you mean, they're much more likely to report it accurately. Next slide. This is a message uh, that I got from researchers. And it's a fine message it's absolutely accurate but reporters would look at that and if they weren't steeped in this particular issue would say what are pops what's inc they know what unep is but they may not know what cryptorchidism is or hypospadias so the next slide is the same message boiled down for the media and please note it's not dumbed down next slide so here a reporter can say tell me about the un treaty tell me about the worst chemicals tell me about the health problems it, it's just more plain speak. Um, here's another example. Do you find this one easy to understand? Or do you prefer the next slide? So we work really hard to get to these boiled down messages. 
will take your study and try and put it into plain language that helps reporters understand it and report it accurately. Next slide. Which brings us to communicating uncertainty, which the uncertainty in science, it's tricky to communicate because as you know, reporters need to report facts, things that are certain, and good science doesn't usually provide that type of certainty. So how do you talk about uncertainty in science and still give the reporter something certain to report? Next slide. You confirm certainty where you know it and acknowledge uncertainty where it exists. We've thought about this a lot and seen it work um, pretty well. So for example, if your messages are based on research that was done using animals and a reporter wants to know, well, what does this mean for my audience, um, for humans? You could say something like, we've certainly seen enough evidence in the lab or we've learned enough um, from these studies to know we should be concerned or investigate further or whatever it is you wanna say. But we don't know for absolute certain at what level this causes health harm in humans because it hasn't been tested on humans, something like that. The phrase, we know enough to know that is it's a really powerful phrase and it's something reporters can use. It, it takes the scientist out of the role of saying, I'm 100% sure of this, but it also puts you in the authoritative role of saying, we know enough to know that we need to do something here. You can flip the burden of proof. The reporter says, so you're not sure early life exposure to phthalates causes health harm. You can say, I'm certain the safety of early life exposure to phthalates hasn't yet been proved, and I'm certain there's enough evidence to be concerned or whatever it is you want to say, to do more study, to um, whatever. You want to be familiar with other points of view reporters are going to hear with reference to the paper you're talking about with them. Be prepared to inoculate reporters to comments that are critical because you know that reporters are going to go seek out another point of view to get that balance. They're going to talk to someone who's critical of your study and see what they say. It's a good idea to tell the reporter, you know, you may hear that this study is limited because this, this, and this, but when you hear that, keep in mind this, this, and this. And that will help the reporter um, make sense of the balance questions. But you should know they're going to talk to other people who are critical. You can check out some websites like American Council on Science and Health or JunkScience.com to see what some of the most common arguments are, or you can ask us, we'll run you through the tough questions. Um, Here's some examples of talking about uncertainty that work really well. The next slide is from an earth justice attorney who I did not media train and I've never met, but it's brilliant. She confirms uncertainty and says what she's sure of. She uses strong language and states what she does and doesn't know and what she does know. I don't know that in every circumstance it will cause harm, but we have seen it cause harm enough safeguards are absolutely required. Those are really strong words, it's very clear, it's something certain a reporter can go with. And yet she isn't saying, um, going outside of her comfort zone. The next slide is an example from The Guardian. <laughs> this has two completely different headlines on the same day about the same study. My guess is that the journalists talked to the researcher and filed their story, and perhaps later that day, someone critical of the study uh, provided another point of view, which changed the story. And that's this could have been avoided by the um, scientist who was initially interviewed inoculating the reporter to these other points of view. They could have been incorporated into the story and put to bed. So tell reporters what they'll hear when they talk to other people and give them your responses first so they won't be so easily pulled off track and they will appreciate that. Okay, the next slide's a biggie. Correlation isn't causation. I'm sure you've all heard this, read it. It's easy for a reporter to write that A causes B, but you know science doesn't usually provide this kind of certainty. And it's a really important distinction, and it's up to the scientist to make sure that reporters get it right. Be clear about whether you found an association or if your finding is causal. I mean, there's a really big difference, and it's one reporters sometimes don't readily understand, um, epidemiology in particular, right? With epi studies, we frequently hear in the media, correlation is not causation, and one study isn't conclusive. Those, those are some of the most um, common things we see. Sometimes you have to gently educate reporters on how science is done and the actual role of epidemiology. So here are some great responses we found. Dr. Dimitri Christaki said, science, I'm sorry, next slide. Oh no, it's on this slide, never mind. Actually, I'm not sure, Em, do we have the next slide? Okay. Slide, Amy. Okay, thank you. Um, he said, scientific inquiry is an iterative process and rarely does a single study provide definitive evidence. 
And for PBS's NOVA, Joan, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but you said this beautifully, epidemiology isn't meant to find X causes Y, but it helps us to begin to connect the dots with the goal of more complete understanding. You know, it's also good to point to animal research that supports your findings where possible. You know, our findings are consistent with research on mice that shows. Bottom line is if you don't want to cause alarm and you're concerned about your work being taken seriously and being reported accurately, the word cause, as in this exposure caused that effect, should raise a huge red flag if you hear yourself or the reporter using it. You need to correct it. Okay. Um, next slide is to be clear about your findings. Um, the headlines here are attention getting, but the problem is that this research was done in mice, not humans. So the headlines picked up everywhere were misleading and implied that the study was on kids and the findings are causal. Failing to make sure the reporter knows the details and limitations of your study and that the reporter understands the difference between association and causation can really damage your credibility with reporters. Um, you know, and also keep in mind the scientist may have done a great job conveying this to the reporter and the article might be just fine, but when the editor tweaked the headline to sell more papers, this may have happened. Um, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen and there's really not much you can do except move on. If it's not that bad. You can complain, write a letter to the editor, but if the article's good, you generally wouldn't. So let's talk about presentation on the next slide. How you sound and how you look. Um, this is for radio and Skype or commuter, commute, uh, sorry, computer interviews um, or webinars. For on-camera and television, it's another training, um, some very tactical stuff. So how to sound on the next slide. A lot of interviews are done over email, but many are done on phone and especially radio. On phone and radio interviews, you never know if you'll be on the air the minute you pick up the phone or if you'll be asked to wait. So you wanna be ready. They will usually tell you We'll call you and you'll talk to a, an associate producer or somebody for a little bit, and then you'll be on the air. They may, that may or may not happen, even if they tell you that. You wanna be ready. Warm up your voice before the interview starts, before you pick up the phone, because it's really hard for people to just start talking after we've been silent for a while. Our voices sound strange, so you might even wanna hum if you know you're not on air. During the interview, vary your tone, your inflection, emphasize words. Remember that people can't see your gestures or your facial expressions. Your inflection can guide them, help them stay interested in what you're talking about. Try not to speak too quickly. Saying less clearly is better than saying everything in a rush. And that's where those clear, concise main messages are so important. Speak genuinely, credibly, confidently, because you're the expert. Um, some people are up talkers. They go up at the end of the sentence like they're asking a question, but they're not. Some people are that way only when they're nervous. It, it sounds awful, especially on radio. Um, if you don't have a visual to offset that, it makes the person sound as if they're not confident in what they're saying. Typically, it's that somebody's trying to make sure the audience is understanding them. But if you hear yourself doing it, practice not doing it. Up talking is not a good thing. Listen to yourself talk because that's all people are going to have to go by and you want to find out what your placeholder is. Everyone has one. A placeholder is um, a, um, so, at the end of the day, you know, one of those word or little phrases that you put in over and over and over and it becomes almost like beer, that beer game where you take a shot every time someone says a certain word. If it's a long interview, it can be very annoying. You want to practice not saying that placeholder. Slowing your speech and being prepared with your messages can help with that too. And finally, assume that you are always on the air, no off the cuff remarks. Even when you think the interview is over, until you hang up the phone or turn off your computer, you wanna assume that you're on the air or being recorded. Um, a really terrific pediatrician was walking on a, an area that was cited for a public school. He was with a television producer who was a family friend and they're walking and talking and doing their interview. And then the camera operator puts the camera down and they're walking back to the car and the producer says, so would you let your kid go to school here? And the pediatrician says, hell no. And of course that's what made it onto the show. So you really want to assume that you're always on until you've walked away and you are absolutely positive it's over. Next slide, please. This is how you wanna look on a computer camera. You don't wanna shoot up your nose, and the way you avoid that is angle the camera so you're looking directly into it or a few inches below. You can raise your laptop so the camera is just at eye level. 
You want the light in front of you, not behind you, because the camera is going to pick up the light and it will darken your face. With a window behind you in daylight, you will just be a shadow like this poor man. Um, for background, give yourself time before the, the interview or the webinar to see what other people are going to see and adjust it. Is your office messy? Is there something really personal or distracting on the wall behind you? Look critically at yourself on camera. Fix anything you don't like. And also beware of background sound, no ringing phones, barking dogs, loud colleagues in the hallway. And finally, distractions, even attractive ones aren't good. You may remember a BBC interview with a man who, um, his child came in in the middle of the interview and everyone who saw this talked about how great this man was with his kid. It made national news, what a great dad he was. And his wife came in to grab the child and he just laughed. It was all wonderful. Thing is, almost nobody remembers what the interview was about. So you really don't want distractions, even if they're cute and make you look like a nice person. Next slide is about the questions you hope reporters don't ask you. Um, these fall into a few broad categories. Next slide, please. And certainly there are many more, but the, the general, most often tough questions are policy. Should this be banned? Um, what are the implications of your findings on public policy? And no matter what your personal beliefs are, if you're being interviewed on your science, think carefully about whether or not you want to weigh in on policy. You're an expert on your science, but are you a policy expert? Because if you, offer, if you aren't and you offer an opinion on policy, you may be giving up some of your credibility as a scientist because it will be assumed you have an advocacy agenda. Um, if you're more senior in the field, you can play with that a little differently. You might have more ability to go off your science. But especially for people um, junior and mid-career, it's a better idea to separate policy and science like Drift and State. You can refer reporters to someone who can talk about policy, but you stick with the science. Um, you know, you can say whatever you want. I would never tell a scientist what to say, but here's an honest and safe response. I'm not a policymaker, but I hope my research helps inform policies to protect public health. Um, it's true, you're not overstating your area of expertise. A response like that can even add to your credibility on the science. And there are personal questions. There's no right or wrong here. Everybody should find their own comfort zone before you start interviewing. If you wait until the question is asked, you're going to look like a deer in the headlights. And the question is almost always asked with environmental health science. What would you do? What would you do if you were pregnant and lived this close to a fracking site? A really good, not personal answer that will usually get you back where you want to go is, you know, it's not about what any one of us does. This is really a public health issue. You can also say, um, we'll get to this next, giving advice, because you can give some advice. Reporters will, they will almost always ask you, what should people do to avoid this exposure? Or what should people do to avoid this? The main point here is don't give medical advice unless you're an MD. It's a real trap. Okay. But you can have mainstream fact sheets ready from NIHS, from CDC, from wherever you, you like. And a good phrase is, for those who want to avoid this exposure, here are some good resources or take some tips from there and throw them out, but not controversial stuff unless you want to be seen as giving advice. And be prepared for criticism. Grow a thick skin. You know the reporters are going to try to find another point of view to round out their stories. Find the areas where you're sensitive before you talk to reporters and think through how you'll respond to those questions. Those questions you just really hope they don't ask you, they're probably going to ask you. Um, on the next slide, we're going to talk, we have a case study you, on fluoride. You're probably familiar with this study. It was in JAMA Pediatrics last month. Uh, it got a lot of attention, so I'm going to use it here to illustrate a few points. Okay, I, I can't see you, but I suspect everyone knows the study or knows of it, but we'll just move forward. Next slide, please. Okay. So there, it's our, okay, the reporter's question here was likely, should fluoride be taken out of drinking water? It's a reasonable question. It's a policy question. The author, Christine Till, answered beautifully, it's our hope that our findings and all the other studies are used to inform policy. And I believe she added the, and all the other studies because fluoride is such a hot topic. It was a great answer. Next slide. The question to the authors here was, what would you advise a pregnant woman to do today based on what you now know? 
The speaker was comfortable giving some personal thoughts, but also made clear this need to be addressed, needs to be addressed on a policy level. Um, again, find your comfort zone before you start interviewing, your comfort zone on personal questions, because you will be asked and you should be prepared. But these are answers that journalists found solid enough to be reporting fact, to be reporting news, and yet they protected the scientists. Next slide. In general, you want to be sensitive to socioeconomic issues, or you may appear culturally tone deaf. Always consider cost before you answer. Um, some people can't afford the solutions, and you don't want to be telling people to do things they can't afford. It will just give people who want to critique your science an absolute clear shot <laughs> to, to mm -hmm. tear it apart. Which brings us to controlling the interview. Um, I love this quote, forewarned, forearmed, to be prepared is half the victory. And that's certainly true with media work. Next slide, please. Journalists use different techniques to help them get a story. Sometimes it's just personal style, but other times they might be little tricks to get you to say more than you want to. And once you know what they are, you'll never fall into these traps. But for example, here are the most common ones. Don't fill awkward, silent pauses. It, you, the reporter may just be taking notes because a lot of reporters, they still write in longhand. Or it may be a trick to get you to say more than you want to because it's human nature that silence drives us to keep talking, to fill the void. And we end up saying more than we should. When you're done with your answer, be aware this might be going on if the reporter's silent and just sit quietly and wait. You can say, is the interview over? Or you can say, you know, one more point I'd like to make and repeat your main messages. We strongly urge you not to speculate or hypothesize because it's really easy to be reported out of context if you do. Um, watch the news and you'll see even politicians routinely say, I'm not gonna speculate on that. It's, it's, a, it's very easy to be misconstrued. Just tell the reporter, I don't wanna speculate and go back to your main messages. And sometimes the reporter may try to get you to say more than you want to or agree to um, what they think is the story. They may have already you know, read your study and thought they've got the whole article written and they got to get home and get the kid to swim team. And you have to stop them. If you think they've got it wrong, you must correct them. You can say, no, that's not quite right. It's this. And go back to your main messages until you're pretty sure they've got it right. Usually this won't happen more than once. Um, the reporters are really smart. They'll catch on. But sometimes they can push you to exaggerate to make a better story, and you don't want to do that. Um, and these tactics are sometimes called gotcha journalism. They really don't happen often, but if you're aware, they will never be used to your disadvantage. Take a look at this on Twitter from a gotcha reporter. My point here is reporters really aren't. 99% of the time, they're not trying to trick you. They really want to tell your story well. But every once in a while, somebody might use a little tactic to get you to say more. Which brings us to our next slide, which are general tips for controlling the interview and hopefully having a good time. You want to be prepared with solid messages. This is what you want to see in every story here in every um, video about your study. You want to be concise, give the headlines and let the reporter ask for details in the areas that interest them. Remember the POPs example. Don't overwhelm the reporter. Let them pick what interests them and take it from there as long as it fits with your main messages. Before an interview, think through those tough questions you might get from reporters and find responses that you're comfortable with. Practice it with friends or colleagues. Do some research. You're going to feel more comfortable if you know about the reporter that you're going to be talking with. Look around. See what they've been writing. Does their, report, does their reporting um, that you find online indicate a bias or a specific area of interest? Who is their audience? Because that's who you're talking to. The reporter is just your conduit to that audience. And if you don't, can't find anything about a reporter, you can certainly write to us and we'll, um, we'll tell you right away. There's no such thing as off the record because it means different things to different people. If you say something to a reporter, it can be used. And there are exceptions. There are some reporters who hate that I say this because they rely on off the record material for the reporting all the time. If you have a relationship, a trusting relationship with a reporter and you really believe they're gonna protect you, fine, go off the record, give them background. 
But if you're not sure, um, it's better to think that anything you say can be end up in print with your name next to it. You know, even the best reporters make mistakes. A very top New York Times reporter asked for um, asked us for a photograph, and we got one from a particular photograph. We got one from a scientist, gave it to him with the explicit understanding that it would not be credited to this scientist. Well, the journalist made a mistake, and he thought he was doing her a favor by crediting her. And the minute it hit their website, we saw it, and we tried to reach him. He was off hiking in Asia. We did reach him, and it was taken down immediately, but you don't want to go through that. Better is to think there's no such thing as off the record. Be honest about what you know and what you don't know. I don't know, or that's not my area of expertise, are fine answers. You can refer reporters to others if you can't help them, but it's human nature to want to help. People sometimes say things they're not really sure of or that take them outside their area of expertise in trying to be helpful. Don't do that. It doesn't really help reporters. My personal favorite is never start a sentence with, I shouldn't say this, but if it starts that way or you hear that little reminder in your head, just don't say it. You can always call back the reporter and say, you know, I'd like to add one thing or, um, and you may miss the story, but it's better to not say more than you want and miss the story. It, trust me, <laughs> just is. Um, don't assume the reporter knows what you're talking about. You may have sent advanced materials and the reporter may say, yes, I've read everything. They may wish they've read everything. They're just incredibly busy. So start talking with them and kind of gauge what they've actually read or how up to speed they are or aren't. Avoid alarmism by sticking to the facts because even a teeny bit of exaggeration can irreparably damage your credibility. Um, even if it's unintentional, we, we worked on a paper on um, BPA associated with liver tumors in rats and the university um, press office, which wasn't the science press office, but more general, put together a press release that said BPA causes liver cancer. And the scientist said, no, you can't say that. And we certainly agreed. And the new headline was BPA associated with liver tumors and rats. You want to be really careful that even materials created for you by others don't exaggerate, you know, as you wouldn't. Next slide, please. Don't overstate the science. Don't let the, the Again, don't let the reporter think a study was on humans if the finding was in rats, but do tell them what the science shows and why it matters to their audience. Try not to use jargon or acronyms when talking to reporters. Talk in a sophisticated but understandable way, avoid, avoiding insider lingo, or you just might make the reporter feel stupid and that, that's not good. Speak plainly as if, you know, for an intelligent non-scientist until you know the reporter is up to speed on the scientific jargon. Um, avoid saying no comment. It makes you sound guilty of something. Be concise. Let the reporter ask for more after you've given your main messages. You know, a TV news clip is about eight seconds long, and in print you might have a little longer. So sometimes you'll be um, interviewed by a reporter, say television, they'll talk to you for half an hour or 20 minutes. And when you turn on the news that night, you're saying, that's outrageous, or this shouldn't happen. And the reporter will paraphrase everything because your answers weren't concise enough. So learn, try, if you're going to be interviewed, start to think in terms of short sentences. And repeat the message. Remember, people need to hear it uh, six different times or so in slightly different language. So don't be afraid to, to hit your main messages hard during the same interview. Uh, use inflection and flag words to tell the reporter what's most important. They're looking to you to guide them on what to put in that top part of the article, what's really important here. Phrases like, the most important thing, or if I could tell you just one thing about this, your readers really need to know, you bring them back with that kind of language um, and inflection. Passion is contagious. If you're excited about your science, reporters are going to pick that up and they'll be more interested. So try to convey the passion. Don't be afraid of how excited you are about your paper. And remember that all of this is designed to help make it easier for reporters to understand what you want them to know so they can report it accurately. Um, next slide, please. And I want to reiterate Joan's invitation to get in touch with us if you have studies that are in the pipeline working towards publication, um, and we'll see how we can help. So thank you for your attention. I've been talking a lot. I'd like to hear questions. 
All right, everyone. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box. Um, Amy, I, I have a question maybe to lead us off, mm -hmm. which is when you're talking with a reporter and you're not really sure as to an answer, but it's probably something you should know, it's a detail, how, how do you best handle that? Do you, do you have them wait on the line while you try to look up the answer? Do you send them a paper later? What's the best strategy there when it is something that you really, you really should be able to provide the information, but you need a moment to, to pull it together? I just tell them, just, just say, you know what, I can find that pretty quickly or it might take me half the day or whatever it is. Um, say, I, I do know that, but I want to double check my source or whatever it is, and then offer to get it to them and get it to them by the time you say you will. They'll appreciate your thoroughness and that you're, you're making sure. Yeah, and to add to that, uh, you may get, uh, that's when you may want to ask what their deadline is for the story. So that you know how quickly you need to sort of uh, gather your resources or whatever you said you would get back to them on. Um, that's a good tip. Yeah, that's a really good point because deadlines aren't flexible. So if the reporter says, I need this in five minutes, if you can do it, great. If you can't, you can't. Better to say, I'm sorry, I can't get it that fast than to say, I think it's this. Cool. Um, and another question, I'll just keep asking them in case yeah. until someone else comes up with one. But so you have a story coming out, you have this paper coming out. At what point should you kind of start preparing for media outreach? And it's great that we could reach out to you, but maybe you could also talk a little bit about press offices at universities and how that works. Oh, great question. Um, ideally, you'll get permission from the journal to give your paper to reporters in advance of publication under embargo about a week, five days, three days in advance, a few days, to give them a chance to research and write their paper, their article. Um, embargo means that the journal sets a very specific day and time, usually it could be 12.01 a.m. Eastern, very specific, at which point the, the paper is officially published and anyone may write about it or talk about it. Until that moment, reporters may work on it under embargo, meaning they can't publish or make public anything about the paper. Generally, they will send it to someone critical of your study under embargo, so they're asking the person not to talk about it. Generally, they will um, use that time so that their, st their story can publish the minute your paper does. You often see in, um, in the news, published today in Lancet or you know, today in Nature, that's how reporters do it. They're not writing those stories at that minute. They're, they've been working on them for about a week given permission from the journal. Um, Emma, do you want anything on that before we go to press offices? No. no. Okay. We work with university and institution press offices all the time, and they are fantastic. These are people who have great ties to local media usually, and some national, um, but they will help you. If you go to them first, they'll tell you whether they have the time and the staff to write a press release, which is, a big help. They can send it to their press list. They can work with us and we give them our press list as well. They can post it on Eureka Alert, which is a free service for journalists where they see press releases in advance. Um, and that's where a lot of stories come from. Your university press office can often help with visuals. They might be able to make a short video, all kinds of things. They're great. Bring them in early. Um, yeah, just for, for practical purposes, I think bringing them in early um, is usually if you know that you've just submitted uh, your your paper to a journal, that's good timing to give your press office a heads up. Hey, we've just submitted this. You know, it may not get accepted, but uh, that gives them enough advance notice that they go, okay, it's um, we we can work on this on the op, you know in, as it gets ready for publication. If you give them a week a week's notice, for example, a lot of press offices don't have the resources to jump in in that that short of a frame. Uh, time period um, and, and some each journal is also different on how big or how long the embargo period that they allow uh, papers to have so general rule of thumb is um, once you are s uh, sending back final revisions on your paper that's generally when we tell um, the PIs or the the lead authors to um, say we're considering media outreach for this paper so please don't throw it up online as soon as you get final revisions back um, that gives you a little insulation from 
um, acceptance to online publication. And journals work with this all the time, so they expect it. Okay, that's great, thank you. Okay, so we now have a couple questions from the audience. So we have one from Kat Moon, and she's asking, do you have any additional examples of talking points of how to answer a reporter's question about, would you avoid this exposure? What would you do if this was your child? Because I do think that's a question we get a lot and is particularly yeah. challenging for early stage folks to answer. Yeah, that, we see that all the time. Um, the safest, again, it's a personal question, so find out where you wanna go. Some people say, you know, I would do everything in my power to move if this were happening in my community, or I absolutely filter, my, uh, filter out fluoride from my child's, from water that my child drinks. The safest thing to say, um, it kind of takes a spotlight off of you is, for those who want to reduce their exposure and then you just go to a published fact sheet, something you think is good, find it in advance, have it ready. Here are some tips from NIHS on how to avoid these exposures. You don't want to be the expert telling people how to avoid, but that takes the hint off, it takes the, the spotlight off you. You can also say it really isn't about what any one of us would do. Um, it's, it, this is a public health issue, and that, that works really well. Emily, do you want to say more on that? No, I think, I th I think that's exactly right. Uh, we, we always just coach for those who want to reduce their exposure or those who are concerned and want to reduce their exposure. They can, uh, they can, they can follow these tips from um, CDC or in IEHS, et cetera. It's a good and way to- can, You can also point them to um, some of the advocacy groups that you think are really reputable. If you want to go further and say, you know, um, Environmental Working Group has a really good list of tips for families or people, you know, go to collaborate from wherever, whatever one you like that you feel comfortable with that you think is really credible. Um, the same with policy questions. You can say, I'm not an expert on policy, but if you want to talk to someone who I think is up to speed on this, and you can send them to an advocacy group, a science-based one, hopefully. Um, right, and again, again, with the personal questions, we, Amy and I also say it's also really um, up to the individual scientists what their comfort level is speaking about what they do in their personal lives you just have to find that comfort zone and that um, and what you're more comfortable with before <laughs> doing interviews um, so that you're prepared for that uh, and there's nothing wrong with having prepared your answer in advance almost so that you already know what you're gonna say when you get that question that way you're not off guard and you don't sort of fumble with it mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, because that, that's the question that will come up basically every time. So every time, have a Absolutely. having a prepared answer to that one is is really great. Um, okay, so next question: What should folks do if their institution's press office isn't interested or doesn't have the time to highlight this particular piece of work, but the scientist thinks it's really important? Uh, you can do a couple of things, and that does happen often. You know, press offices are. are often small staffs. You can contact us and if we have the time, also we're two people, but sometimes we can fit things in as well. If um, we think they'll move the science forward, we'll do our best. You can, if you've published studies in the past, you probably have relationships with a few reporters or at least know a few and you can send a personal note. This paper is coming out soon or if you don't have an embargo approved by the journal, you wait till it's published and say, this just published today, it's my new work and I thought you'd like to see it summarize it really quickly for them and see if they'd like to take a look at it. You can use your personal relationships. Um, we can tell you some reporters who we know are covering that issue, even if we're not able to do a whole lot of work on it, if it's last minute, for example. Um, yeah, and I would also say if you have social media accounts that you're active on, that's a way to sort of, don't think of it as self-promotion, but you know, my team and I just published a paper on X, Y, Z and, and posted on your social networks. Uh, you want people to, to see it there. A lot of reporters, for example, are on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. If you use the right hashtags, you know, whether it's PFAS or BPA, et cetera, um, they follow those kinds of things. Yeah, and we're hoping to have Emily back to do a social media training for scientists in the spring. So that's a little teaser. We'll learn more about how to appropriately hashtag and do other things. And someone actually also had a question whether you all are on Twitter and Facebook. Mm -hmm. Emily, I know you are because I follow you on Twitter, but I don't know about um, SCN 
more as a whole. So maybe you could just tell folks how to find you. Emily, go for it. Um, yeah, no, we don't have it. We have an SCN uh, Twitter account, but I would just follow me at Emily at Emily SCN. Um, I'm the most active there and, and sort of uh, and, and most connected on on Twitter. So no Facebook for me. But. Great. Yeah, I typed that. I typed your your handle in the chat so folks can see it there, and we'll we'll send it with some information after the after the talk here today. Okay, we have uh, one more question. So, Marianthi says, I know this is not very common, but what if a journalist does not really show any interest in the interview? How can you engage them more if they're kind of just slogging through because someone said they had to write this up? That's a really funny question. <laughs> I like that. Um, you could ask directly, um, can you tell me what, you know, of the things that we might talk about here, where, where does your interest lie or what, what would be of most greatest interest to your audience? You'd, you'd want to know in advance who they're writing or reporting for, um, not just the paper, but are they um, doing something for CNN or is it more for a, a student newspaper? So think about who their audience is. And if you come up with a, a sort of a way of looking at your study that might be of interest to their audience, that might perk them up a bit. You could also ask. Yeah. And it could be, too, if, it, if you feel like they're not interested. Uh, oftentimes, not maybe not often, but sometimes, it could be that they're not, maybe they're not following the clarity of your messages. Mm -hmm. So maybe just check in and say, was that clear? Um, we can go back to, um, you know, so I can provide further detail or further clarity if, um, just, just sort of check in to make sure that they're following along the main messages that you're laying out. Um, that's one. That's one way. Right, because if you're using jargon or the concepts are ones that they just aren't getting, they will check out. Um, you you don't ever want a reporter to feel stupid. But some of the stuff you all work on is really sophisticated, um, and it, it takes work to bring it to a level that an intelligent non-scientist can really get excited about and with accuracy. We can all get excited by extreme, you know, but if we twist your message, your, you know, your research to some out, outlandish thing, but to get it right, it takes some work. Yeah, and then so also, for example, if there are outlets like Associated Press um, that are sort of syndicated, but if you've ever read an Associated Press article, they're very short, very, very concise. So they could just be on, on and they have really tight deadlines. They could just be on deadline and they are trying to pound this out. Um, and it couldn't be that they're not, not that they're not interested, just that they're busy. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Or that, again, with the case of AP, which is a very good idea, good suggestion, they, um, they don't need a lot. Right. You know, I think you could do is say, I have a press release, if you have one, say, have you seen it or would you like a copy of it? Things like that. And then they can go work on it on their own. Cool. Um, I just want to add, reporters don't get paid enough to work on stories they're not interested in typically. So there's, there's you've got to be some reason they're there if they're interviewing you. Great. So one last thing I'm wondering if you go over, you talked a little bit about embargo and how this works and when it's appropriate to start talking to people about your study. Um, and I know for early career folks who probably haven't done this a lot, it's actually pretty confusing and also sometimes journals put out their own press releases related to studies. So I was just wondering if you could run through the timeline one more time of your paper's been accepted, there's an embargo or not, whether you need to ask the journal about an embargo, um, whether you should remind people you're talking to that the paper is embargoed until X day or do they already know, those sorts of things. Just to really solidify those steps that take place at the end of the paper as it comes to press. Sounds good. And why don't you take this one? Um, again, really every journal has their own embargo policies. So the best thing to do is, is to ask them up front by saying, you know, um, either upon acceptance, we plan to do some media outreach. What are the journal's policies that we can follow in order to set up an embargo period for interested journalists? Um, and, and the journal will generally tell you, uh, depending on which journal, and, and again, they vary depending on uh, the size of staff, 
or where their production team is located, um, they can be kind of slow to get back to you. So that's why we always say the more advanced that you can request that uh, you can see their policies, I think the better, so you can be prepared. Um, but, but on the end of reiterating embargoes, so for example, your press office on the press release, right on the top of it, it's gonna say embargoed until November 13th at 9 p.m. Um, or any note to journalists that we send, for example, will also have the same thing. And then when journalists ask us for to see the study or to ask for an interview, we always confirm that they are going to respect the embargo. So for example, if you, your press office didn't do a press release, but you reached out to the three reporters that you know follow your work or follow BPA and you go, hey, uh, Mariah Blake, uh, have this cool BPA study coming out that I think you may be interested, but it's strictly embargoed until uh, the date and the time. And then usually, that is a flag for journalists when they when they reply back to you they'll say understood will abide by the embargo um, but that is our general experience um, we we rarely see broken embargoes unless it's by the um the editors versus the reporters but we rarely rarely see it happen I, additionally with um folks who are writing for social media for blogs if you're talking to them and your paper is on is embargoed you want to make sure they are follow that they understand journalist rules. Journalists do understand embargoes, but sometimes people new to the field who aren't credentialed journalists don't. And you just want to make real sure they do before you give them um, an interview or your research before the embargo is lifted. If they don't know what it is or say, look, I've got to get this out right away, you say, you know what, I'll talk to you as soon, I'll give it to you the minute it's published. And you get that. Broken embargo is a really big deal because then you have to contact every reporter who's shown interest and tell them and they get really irritated because they thought they had this long to write their story and now they've got this long. Um, not a good thing. Reporters don't, don't generally do it on purpose. It's happened by accident a few times and usually they'll take the story down immediately and they will be your best friend for life because they feel like they owe you. All right. All right. So did we, did we miss anything? Are there any last things you want to point out to folks before we wrap this up? I would make one final point, and that is as you get um, more experience doing interviews with journalists, I would encourage you all to create a spreadsheet um, or a, a, you know, a Google sheet, however you do it, um, that logs reporter names that you have interviews with and take notes. So you go, okay, the guy from AP, when he calls me, He's like this, or I don't talk to the guy from junkscience.com. I don't take calls from Steve Malloy. Um, make personal notes so that you can get better at knowing the journalists who are following uh, your issues and your research. And sometimes those notes will include this person is, you know, has two small children. So you know you're going to get the, well, what would you do question right up front. Like, it's good practice, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good questions. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I invite you to... Get in touch anytime if you have questions um, or if we can help with papers. That's great. Amy and Emily, thank you so much for being here. We will post the recording of this on our website shortly, uh, and we will hopefully follow up with a social media training in the spring. So thanks again.